What's going on, guys? It's Mike with the 1% Mindset Podcast. Hope you guys are doing absolutely, absolutely amazing. I uh, have a good brother with me uh, today, uh, Mr. Ruan Cox, and uh, this is definitely going to be a treat, especially uh, because uh, he has a PhD in something really cool and long, but uh, it's related to infectious diseases, and considering everything that's happening right now, um, I, I'm really excited to kind of dive in and, and speak to you about this. So how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. Been wanting to get on the 1% Mindset for a minute. Really, really great initiative. So thanks for having me. Definitely, definitely. I appreciate I appreciate you being on, man. So, I mean, I think one of the things, I first want to kind of have you introduce yourself because I think it's, it's pretty important. Um, I, I was going to do it, but uh, as I was like looking at it and you know, words I don't understand, you having a PhD, me just having a bachelor's, I figured I wouldn't do you justice. So kind of uh, tell the people a little bit about who you are and then kind of your field that you're in now. Absolutely. So my name is Ruan Cox, like you mentioned. Um, I have a PhD in allergy immunology and infectious diseases. Um, basically, um, I, study, I spent a lot of years studying the body's immune system and how it responds to different um, infectious categories or different categories that just arise just because your immune system is going crazy, uh, for lack of better words, and so we're not working properly. And so like you said, it's just very, 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 very timely at this time what we're going through with the COVID-19 crisis for me to have a background in that. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Florida with my bachelor's of Gators and the University of South Florida with my PhD, as I mentioned before. And so what I do now is I work for Moffitt Cancer Center, the third largest cancer center in the nation. And I do something a little bit outside the box. What I do is I unite the public and private sectors. So I unite Moffitt as a research center and pharmaceutical and tech companies to fill in the gaps to find new technologies and new drugs and new resources and assets that we don't have before. So people that don't have an option, especially when it comes to cancer care, can find that option with new discoveries. So it's pretty cool. It's a cool way to use my science. I get to see something new every day. And I'm always geeking out about something. I'm never bored. Now that's awesome. So, I mean, uh, you know, you said bridging that gap between public and private sector. I mean, there's there's been a ton of research initiatives, a ton of money that's been poured into uh, cancer, uh, the different, you know, the different uh, organizations that specifically around uh, cancer and, you know, finding this cure. Uh, with, with the work that you're in, have you seen improvements, uh, I guess, within, you know, this within cancer and like, I, I guess the healing process or, or finding a cure for it. Absolutely. I mean, I don't really per se, <laughs> I'm not always a scientist. I'm kind of not always a fan of the word cure, but we make improvements every single day. And um, what we do is we learn more. See cancer, you think that cancer is just one disease, but it's hundreds of diseases. You could have melanoma, which affects the skin, non-small cell lung cancer, which of course affects the respects the lungs um, you, you could have you know different carcinomas or um, neuroblastomas so all of those different cancers require different treatment and they require different symptoms and if those cancers get up and go somewhere else in the body or metastasize they call it they go to different places like if you have prostate cancer it goes to the bone if you have breast cancer it goes to the brain so all of those mechanisms and knowing how that works it's like a complicated puzzle and so you need this the brightest um, and the smartest from both the public and the private sector to be able to make that happen. And I see new things about that every single day. Um, it's not just healthcare companies that you would traditionally expect, like the drug companies, but it's also a tech company who's making an algorithm to figure out what the, how the puzzle works and how a doctor should approach it. It's also, you know, doctors have a lot of complicated, and practitioners, I shouldn't just say doctors, but practitioners have a very complicated, a lot of complicated decisions to make when it comes to fighting cancer. And so we have these things called decision support tools that help them to analyze risk and to be able to help them to know, you know, what's best, um, what's, what, what has the highest probability of being a viable option. So when you're talking about cancer, it's prevention, it's treatment, it's therapy, um, and hopefully, hopefully, although I don't like to say it as often, hopefully one day eradication or a cure. Awesome. So, so one of the things that you said, uh, uh, and don't quote me, uh, it's not verbatim, but you said, uh, not that I'm a huge fan of it here. Um, 
So what, what does that mean exactly? Are, are you saying some of these practices you don't agree with? Is there a, another alternative that you, that you deem better? Uh, what, what was that? Um, cure. So that word, I mean, for us, you know, when you, when you hear the word cure, you know, cancer is something that could always come back. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's, it's really, I mean, if you think about the mechanism of how cancer works, it's the body's own, you know, our body is like a computer, man. And so our body knows how to play the game. Our body knows how we work. And so, of course, one of the, the worst things about cancer is that you're having a disease where your body is basically hijacking itself to produce dangerous things that take over other parts of the body and shut us down. And so um, it's important to know that cancer is a complicated system. And so where, whereas you might touch and reach one part of it, and there are many success stories on how to manage it and how to make sure it doesn't come back, it involves so many things. It involves your lifestyle, how you eat. It involves your emotional sensibilities and keeping your spirits high. It's not just about a treatment. It's about your holistic approach to it. Um, and that's why I'm so privileged to work at a place like Moffitt um, or you see these other places like you hear about Cleveland Clinic, Memorial Sloan Kettering, MB Anderson, you know, um, these places that they're providing really top-notch care. And what's really great about it is that there's a team of people, researchers like me, sci um, physicians and medical oncologists, nurses, you know, um, um, psychologists, all these folks that are pouring into the patients who give them good care. So it's, 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 it's not just a one and done thing, like we can just cure it. It's, it involves a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Oh, awesome. I think, uh, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, and some of my listeners know, I had a rare skin cancer. I'm not even sure if you knew, um, but I had a rare skin cancer called dermatofibrosarcoma, something like that. And, uh, it's, they, they said at the time it was like a thousand cases a year, like one in mm. one million people get it. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's very rare. And I, I, I was always curious, um, at least with, within the cancer space. And, you know, again, I was fortunate enough to, I didn't have to worry about like doing chemotherapy. I did something called mold surgery, which you may be familiar yep. with. And then exactly. They basically were, were able to cut it out and I had to, you know, have to do uh, yearly checkups just to make sure it doesn't come back. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the one of the things I was researching, you know, after I did uh, most surgery and was a lot of holistic stuff. I know for a little bit, at least within the black community, like Dr. Sevy became really popular because uh, Nipsey Hussle passed away, and you know, he what his big thing was was you know you can't get any diseases if you can't if uh, you know mucus isn't there, right? And the way to get rid of mucus is to have this holistic, like you said, approach and just eating uh, like the sea moss and stuff like that. Uh, have you done any research with that? Is, do you think there's any truth behind that? Like, what are your thoughts with that? Of course, man, there's a whole field behind like, um, you know, the holistic approach, nutraceuticals, um, basically instead of pharmaceuticals, you're using those natural products. And I mean, realistically, a lot of our drugs come from these, are, are based on these natural products that already exist. And you're taking those natural products and you're purifying them and you're getting the best out of those products and you're targeting them to, to have those specific um, advantages to target whatever you need to target. And so whatever is going wrong that's making your cancer or your body go crazy, that's what those pharmaceuticals target. And they're all mm -hmm. based off, a lot of them are based off nutraceutical um, things that naturally exist in the environment. Um, I did my dissertation on omega-3 fatty acids. I mean, those things naturally exist in the environment. Your brain, your heart, I mean, your brain, your lungs, and your eyes are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids. So much so that when you have an injury that happens, those omega-3 fatty acids co convert to things that enable you to resolve or heal very, very, very quickly. And so my dissertation was based on giving those things that change within that time frame at an earlier time point and watching the body heal much more rapidly. So, I mean, natural products is proven. Uh, and that's why you really can't sleep on that. You really can't discredit that. Um, it, Western medicine or, you know, or Eastern medicine, they both have their specific hot pros and cons regarding it. Um, but I think that it would be crazy to think about um, how things, how things that are natural in the environment just don't work. And I'm Jamaican, so you know, you think about you weren't talking about Tylenol or 
or, or, or flu medicine or whatever. You know, if you had a sore throat, it was like honey and tea. You know, it wasn't um, any type of, you know, uh, pharmaceutical intervention. It was just honey and tea. So, Why do you think the U.S. Ha hasn't adopted more so um, the holistic route, right? If you said that, you, you know, with the fatty acids and the omega-3 acids that you speak about as far as healing, uh -huh. um, and the possibility of it, you know, whether that's curing, I guess, curing cancer, so to speak, maybe, mm -hmm. or just some of these infectious diseases. Why do right. you think the U.S. hasn't adopted uh, that method, that methodology in terms of using that as healing power and rather, you know, using medicines or things that aren't necessarily, uh, you know, proven, so to speak? Well, I mean, I, you know, Ideally, everybody wants you to say money, right? Money makes the world go around. We're in a capitalist market, of course. And it has a lot to do with it. But the burden of proof is just so high, right? And so ideally, um, you, you have to be able to prove that these herbal remedies beat out the, the gold standard that's already there. And they can produce things at a higher rate or they can produce things just as good. And so you have to spend money on that. Ideally, also, you have to be, people want to be able to protect that with like a patent or some type of protection that nobody else can use so they can continue to make the money. And so you can't really, you know, protect a grass that's like naturally growing in the environment. What you do is you learn about that grass, you learn what specific aspect of that grass causes the solution that you want. And then you take that and you synthesize that specific component in that grass. You go and you check to see if anybody else has synthesized that specific component, you patent it, and boom, there you go. But within focusing on that specific patent or focusing on that specific component, one would argue that you've lost some other medicinal properties of the whole entire plant itself or the whole entire herb or product, natural occurring thing itself. So, I mean, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to, 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 that goes into it, sure. A lot of it's monetary. Some of it is like specifics, like is that specific remedy enough or in a large enough quantity to be able to cause the intended effect? And um, some of that people just don't invest in what they can't wholly and idealistically own. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's kind of my take on it, why it hasn't really taken off as much. Got it. So some money and some, I mean, it sounds a lot like money. You know, yeah, but, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot of money, but it's a lot of different aspects of where your money is going. Sure. Um, but I mean, hey, you, you're in a, um, if, if there are certain schools that you go to that, you know, you, you go and you learn about, um, that's the difference between getting an MD and a doctor of osteopathy, right? They learn about all of these alternative, the DO learns about all of these alternative treatments. And so we won't say that an MD or a DO is better, but their knowledge base um, they have enhancements in their knowledge base in different areas, um, which is what makes the medical team and the medical practice so, uh, so, so compelling and powerful is that you're bringing together a group of specialists or a group of individuals who have different training that can contribute different things. What, 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 um, what limits ultimately the end user, which is the patient, what limits, um, or, or, um, what limits them is when things become siloed and there is shunting of thought that one thing isn't better than the other and there's no teamwork. And sometimes you see that's what's happened. It's like this drug is the only thing that can be effective. And so when that happens, then you're only harming the patient because they're not getting that collaborative teamwork of intellectuals that bring different things to the table. Mm. And, ju and just for uh, user, you know, people that are listening and probably myself included, uh, a DO is a person who studies like the medicinal medicines versus the MD. I so a DO, a DO is a doctor of osteopathy and a MD is a medical doctor. They're both, you know, the two main uh, medical practitioners that are, you know, that you see when you go to the doctor's office or you go to the hospital or you go to whatever, you know, um, any type of specialty office. So they're recognized um, um, by the medical boards as the primary four-year degrees that you go to before you can go into like a residency, like a surgery or, uh, or, um, or uh, uh, oncologist or a pediatrician or what have you. Mm -hmm. So, and they just learn different things. Like I said, a doc, uh, osteopathic medicine also takes in, in, in some of those alternative or holistic treatments as well. 
that encourage them into their practice, but they also have knowledge of the same Western medicines as well. So it's very, it's, it's just a different, um, it's, it's some things that are added experiences. Got it, got it. Okay, no, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely uh, good to know. So I, I, I kind of want to switch, and I mean, you, you definitely have a, a, a wide palette when it comes to cancer. You're working, you know, at a cancer, uh, cancer treatment center. Uh, right now, obviously, I'm not sure if you're working from home currently, because uh, you're probably an essential worker. Are you, are you currently at home working from home? Yep, yep, yeah. So oh. I work, I work, I, I've, I've been working from home now. I mean, we have uh, some options to go in. Um, but for right now, in terms of the, the workforce, a lot of the, the operations with research and lot, anything that our directives or anything that can be done um, from the basis of your home will be done from the basis of your home. So that's where I'm at now. Got it. So working from home now, obviously, so that segue was really to go into, you know, what's happening right now in this, in this world, which is uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus. Um, I, I want, I mean, I have a few questions, but before I even dive in, I kind of want to know what, like what your take is, you know, because early on, uh, let's say even January, even some of February, uh, you know, it, it wasn't really taken very seriously. Um, obviously, there was a widespread uh, you know, in, in China and, you know, it, it's now become a global pandemic. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on it right now? Like with what's happening, how we're responding uh, as a country, um, what you've been hearing, like kind of give me a little bit of overview of what you're thinking so far. Man, you know, um, it's funny because it's, it, it's, it's not really funny, but like I geek out about this stuff, like I said before earlier. So I, I'm, on, I'm on the CDC guidelines every single day. I'm looking at stuff about COVID-19 every single day when this thing broke out um, because of the exact way that COVID-19 enters your body, it causes a syndrome that I, I did in my dissertation. So I, I actually hit up my boss and say, hey, we should write a paper on this um, and really, you know, get in front of this, try to put some literature out. Um, you know, I'm really passionate about this type of stuff, um, especially, you know, being an immunologist and, and, and being in pulmonary, like where my training was. And so, Ultimately, I think that the way that it was handled, you know, and there's no way, there's no perfect way that it could have been handled. Um, but the way that it was handled is, I, I think it was mismanaged a lot. Um, information in terms of being serious. I mean, and ideally we didn't know enough about a lot of things when it came to this virus. We didn't know, you know, when you're, when you're talking about a virus, you're talking about, you know, prevailing thoughts on some um, some of these uh, different, you know, viral species is that they may not last a long time. And then word comes out that this thing can last up to like nine days on cardboard. You know, uh, you're talking about the different levels of PPE that should be utilized. You're talking about uh, who it affects, you know, the elderly or whatnot. Why does it affect the elderly? Because a lot of times their systems are not as strong as they used to be. Well, if you have an immunocompromised system, i.e. you have cancer, you have HIV, you have uh, diabetes, you have other things that are going on that make your system a little bit weaker, you're just as liable because um, that respiratory condition ultimately causes a lack of oxyg oxygenation to other aspects you know, in your body and then you have what's called secondary organ failure, and then you could ultimately die um, from the shutdown of your kidneys or the shutdown of other organs that may be vital. And so it, that just may be one aspect of how something like this disease or like a pneumonia um, or other respiratory diseases, how they ultimately um, lead to death. So, I mean, a lot of the misinformation that has been put out there, and then we live in a world now where information travels so fast, so there's no verifying of the information. Uh, there's no verifying of information. So you got spring breakers out here thinking that we good because I'm young. You have other people, you know, some, some countries, their, their motto was just let, let us get it and then it'll pass through and then we'll be good. We'll survive it. You know, it's kind of Dar Darwinian in nature, like survival of the fittest. Um, but then people don't realize like, hey, just like you can get the flu multiple times in one, one season, you can get this thing multiple times. And even before you started hearing about this, COVID-19 uh, in, in the same breath, it's like when you start hearing about it in February, maybe when it started to, to gain a little bit of traction, 
what was going on in December, November, October, where people that were presenting with cases that were similar to this having early stages of COVID-19, you know, and how is it transmitted? They just said that a tiger in the zoo got um, COVID-19. And so is it transmitted? Does it have a specific species that it attacks um, or that it, that it can attach to? So it's, it's interesting times. And, and, and we propagate the um, paranoia and the fear of it with also misinformation. And then um, you don't know, depending on which government official or agency you're listening to, you don't really know who's on first or who's on second. Um, is it Health and Human Services? Is it the CDC? Um, is it, you know, who, who is it the NIH? Who are these people that are on first that are guiding this? So, I mean, it's, a, it's just a, a, just a mismatch of, of many causes for it to be a bad situation for many people. Have you noticed any disparity uh, as far as um, whether it's racial groups or underserved communities as far as whether that's information, them, uh, those underserved communities may be even, whether it's more effective, not getting testing, like that, that I, I know testing was a big thing for a long right. time and it probably still is a big thing uh, for, for a lot of people. Have right. you, based on whether it's research, what you've seen, what you've heard, has there been anything ar uh, around that as far as that, that group of people? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's always going to exist, you know, whether it's research, testing, spread of information, access to PPE, uh, the centers and treatments that we go with. And so a lot of our, our folks, you know, in the minority and specifically in the African-American community, you know, their, their causes may not be taken as seriously. Uh, there's less of a resource, less of resources and accesses Access, access to N95 respirators or even surgical masks, um, ventilators, and uh, being able to have access to a ventilator that maybe there may be multiple or many different, uh, a larger number of ventilators um, in maybe a higher socioeconomic status area. Um, also the presentation of their, um, of their symptoms. When you have symptoms that are like, hey, I have a dry cough, I have, uh, you know, I have a fever, your symptoms aren't being taken um, into account. And so now you have a population that is prone um, to things like uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, different forms of cancer, et cetera. And now it hits them a little bit harder because of access to care uh, disparities, um, as well as them being taken seriously, as well as that maybe the preference for writing a script for somebody or the burden of proof for them to get a test you know, I personally believe that a doctor shouldn't be sitting here and saying like, okay, you get to get a test because I deem you worthy because you present these symptoms. No, how about I get a test because I want to get a test because that's what I want medically. The patient is a big part of the treatment algorithm. And so ideally you need to listen to the patient and what the patient is presenting with so that they can get access to care. And so you never know how your misinterpretation could end up causing a life and your anticipation of that patient's needs could end up saving a life. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, um, uh, of the former rather than the latter in our communities. And it's, it, it definitely hurts us, it definitely hurts us. There's, there's been a lot of, some, can, some may call it conspiracy theorists, some may you know, say it's true. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard of the whole 5G thing now and, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, it's 5G that's causing certain things. I've had, I've seen like a couple of doctors speak out and saying, you know, it's possibly 5G and it, the symptoms that they're treating is not really what it is. Patients are gasping for breath and it seems like an altitude, like what's your what's your thoughts on that obviously doing research and you know you yeah. having being a specialist in this area you know kind of kind of what's your thought on it because it like you said information travels quickly now uh, i'm mm -hmm. known to deem it true or false i have no idea uh but you're you know th this is your area kind of what's your what's your thoughts on that and is there any validity behind you know what people are saying now full disclaimer i have never gone into a lab and presented a, a patient with a 5G radio 
<laughs> and or, or or an animal or a laboratory animal with a 5G radio and seeing the the subject, you know, present with any of these symptoms. So full disclaimer, in the truest of factual sense, you know, I guess I can't like be like, you know, I've I, 5G is out there, but it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> like, I mean, you know, and just to take it scientifically, right? We have these things in our lungs, um, and some of our cells in our lungs, we have these receptors or these receivers called ACE2. And so the virus, what it does is it attaches to that ACE2, um, kind of like you're sticking a circle in a, circu a circular peg and a circular hole, and it attaches to the ACE2 properly. And then once it attaches to the ACE2, it spits in the genetic material and it says, ha ha ha, I got you. Now I'm reprogramming your cell to make more copies of me. And then it makes enough copies until the cell basically dies and releases thousands of these viruses to then go and make more. And so ultimately that's what it works. What happens to your lungs when that happens is you have a breakdown of, depending on which cells in your lungs it attacks, you have, the lungs are responsible for exchanging gas, carbon dioxide and oxygen. It's like inhalation and exhalation is how we breathe. So if your lungs aren't working properly, you're going to have these respiratory issues. And then once you have these respiratory issues, you're not going to be able to get oxygen, which is what your body runs on and some of the fuel that your body runs on into your system. So you're going to have shutdown of vital organs and vital processes. That's literally how this stuff works in a nutshell. You know what I'm saying? The virus is attacking your lungs, your respiratory system is not able to function properly, and you can't get all the oxygen it needs to the rest of your body. And so ultimately, you have this thing called respiratory distress syndrome, and you start to shut down. Um, so the 5G thing is crazy to me. Um, you know, like I said before, I can't sit here and say there's an actual study that's been done that totally disproves it, but it's crazy, and it's fanatical you know, hogwash, in my opinion. You've heard it here first, you know. Dr. Ruan Cox said it's uh, hogwash. No. For, lack of, for lack of worse words. <laughs> <laughs> no, and so, okay, so we're, we're in the heart of it, right? Uh, when this is being recorded, it's April. Man, you're in the heart of it. Well, yeah. So, so, yeah. I, yeah, so yeah, literally, you know, I'm in the heart of it, uh, the epicenter, New York City, uh, where we have, I believe it's at this point, over 100,000 cases um, okay. right now. And so just to put it in context, if you took New York City and New Jersey, uh, New York City plus New Jersey would have more cases, more reported cases than any other country in the nation, in the world. And it's, it's important to know reported cases. Because as we talk about this right now, China's still standing at like 82,000 reported cases. So, you know, it's important to note that that just how how it's not necessarily when, when people when you, when you talk about how important this stuff is, and I wanted to just drive home this point, we got to do a little bit of extrapolation and a little bit of multiplication with this. If you've only tested, you know, you got 330 some odd million people in America. You've only tested, you know, maybe let's say you tested 100,000 people and 10,000 came back positive. It's reasonably, it's reasonable to assume that that means that probably 33 million people in the U.S. might have this disease or have had this disease or been a case of this disease. So you're not taking it seriously because you may only see like, I don't know, 180,000 total or you only see you know, 5,000 or, or 12,000 in Florida. But it's important to know that a lot of that numbers, those numbers are, are, are not representative because of the lack of access to testing. You know, I've never seen that some, it to where like, you gotta be approved to be tested. And something like this, it's crazy. So I just wanna drive on that point. Based on all the research you've done, is, is COVID-19 is this, I don't want to say unique, but is this like almost mind blowing, so to speak, as far as what, what it looks like in terms of uh, the, the healthcare world? Because it seems like, I mean, there's, again, SARS came about and, you know, I was, I think that was early 2000. So I was, I was a lot younger then. Um, 
you know, the flu, you know, at first when they were speaking about COVID-19, they're like, well, the flu is worse. You know, there's X amount of people with the flu and only this amount of people with, you know, the coronavirus. So people are, you know, and I think that's what initially started like the no big deal thing with COVID-19, mm-hmm. in, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Um, mm-hmm. But now as this is starting to multiply as, you know, more people are starting to, you know, to uh, either pass away or just be contracted with this disease, is this almost like a, I want to say like a mind blown or, or one of those once in a lifetime kind of things that you just really don't see? You know, it's crazy because uh, me and my girlfriend, we were, um, we were walking around yesterday. And so, and we're making, we're wearing masks, right? And everybody around us is wearing masks. And it's, it's crazy to think like, we're just talking. We are like, man, do you ever think like this would be your normal? Like you're sitting here, and you're just walking around wearing masks, like, and that's like normal. Everybody's doing it, even for a short period of time. And you're always gonna sit and you're gonna think, like, hey, you remember when we 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 had to survive like COVID nineteen or the pandemic? And you know, people always go through these things, but some parents are having to explain to their kids, like, mommy, daddy, why am I stuck in the house? Like what is coronavirus or whatever? And you're having to explain it to your kids. You're going to have, these kids are going to grow up as if it was like, you know, um, as if it was one of those natural, huge natural disasters or huge pandemics that they had to deal with. Um, and that's going to be part of their reality. So, you know, in short, yeah, um, absolutely. It's definitely, you know, when people say throw 2020 away, they'll always remember like why they felt like that. And it make it clear there is no, there's no end to this in sight because, you know, what's going to happen when people get released and they're like back into their wild, right? I don't want to call it wild. Like, you know, we are animals, but I don't want to call it wild. Like it's a jungle, but what's going to happen when people get released? You know, what's going to stop a resurgence? China right now is going through a, a little bit of a resurgence and, you know, they're starting to open their stuff back up, but they were quarantined. They were locked down for months. So um, it's, it's interesting times to say the least. Uh, and, and we're at least about four or five months away from any type of actual product being on the market that can, that can combat this. You know, people don't understand. Even the flu test, you get flu shots. It's not 100% accurate. The flu can mutate because it's a virus. Same thing with, you know, what's COVID-20 going to be like? You know, people are always going to think about that. Some people are always going to adopt a new way of cleaning their groceries or a new way of, um, of, of taking precautions because they experienced COVID-19. So, and, and, and I think one of the real big differences is that it's things like uh, maybe, maybe SARS, but Ebola or places like that, they, a lot of it never really hit the U.S. like that, like this, like this, you know? And so now, it's, it, was, it was like, oh, man, that sucked when it was going on in Africa or this part of China or whatever. But now you're seeing the, you know, one of the world's biggest superpowers getting hit with this disease. And it's absolutely a uh, disaster. And now you kind of get a, get a sense of maybe what some of those other experiences were also like for other people who will never forget, you know, in another part of the world getting Ebola or, um, you know, if they made, if they, if they survived it, so yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's crazy. I was just thinking about, you know, one thing you said, which was like just cleaning your groceries, right? Who would, who would think, you know, you, you get a package or you got a grocery and you got to wipe it down before you put it into the fridge or, yeah. you know, like yeah. it, it, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely insane. Um, so, I mean, I won't, I won't hold you too long. So I, I think one of the things I want to ask, so what's, what do you deem like the next steps? Obviously we're quarantined for the next, I don't know how long. I mean, you know, New York was a little bit late to the party. I don't want to say we were late to the party. Florida was definitely a lot later than New Florida York was. late to the party. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, New York, as far as big cities, like California shut down schools. A lot of places were shutting down schools and then New York finally shut down their schools. I believe it was like the 13th or something like that of uh Mm -hmm. of march and now it looks like there's no end in sight do you do you see kids in the u.s going back to school uh at least by the end of the year do you think that's that's basically done no i mean i think a lot of places are saying that 
you know, as far as the school year is concerned, you know, would that be colleges or, uh, or that be high schools or public schools, charter schools, pub, private schools, what have you, you know, they're, they're working on that guidance for no, um, no, you know, staying virtual. And then also you're talking about staying virtual, no testing, um, and then no graduation for some of these children. So a lot of these once in a lifetime events for them are robbed because of this, it, it, obviously because we have to stay safe, but because of this pandemic. And I mean, I think ultimately the next steps is that our research force, our clinical force, the brightest minds um, in the US and those around us, that's those also in the community. You know, the community plays a big role the community plays a big role in propagating the information that is right, that we should be staying safe, that we should be protecting ourselves, that we should be wearing our masks, that we should be exercising proper social distancing, that we should be, um, look how creative people have gotten uh, amidst the chaos with virtual brunches and virtual happy hours and uh, virtual get togethers with friends. Um, and I mean, I don't believe that this will be something that will exist, but you have to prepare yourself um, for it being an extended period of time. And so the community is so important in making sure that the message gets out, um, making sure that people who are displaced because of this, whether that be the students or whether that be the elderly, you know, people who are um, getting this disease and dying alone, you know, uh, people who are maybe expecting a child that now they have to give birth to that child under different circumstances. They can be the only person in the room or what have you. And so you have to think about how your life changes a little bit because of this. Um, and so community information is gonna be very important to make sure that we are following proper guidance and we're not un unjustly and unduly spreading this disease because of misinformation. Then the brightest and best minds in, in these different categories have to get together and, and making sure that it's not for greed, but it's just for pure human benefit that we are putting together rapid testing so people can get tested and figure out um, what's going on in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. Um, we can have access to testing so that there's no shortages. You know, 3D printing has starting to become popular with the production of cotton swabs and masks so people can protect themselves. Um, and then you also have to have treatment and you have to have um, other things like uh, there are some folks who the problem with ventilators is that they can only handle the load for one person. And so now you have people who are being bright and using their creativity to jerry-rig a ventilator so it handles eight people at a time or six people at a time. Um, and then ultimately the vaccines, the drugs, the inhibitors, and those type of things to stop either the spreading or the contraction or slow down uh, or, or, in, or increase the healing time or decrease the healing time um, the time that it takes to heal from this disease. So I think there's a lot of things that are involved and in, we all play a role in that. We play a role in the community, we play a role in helping to um, fund the research, you know, talking to our congressmen and congresswomen or our rep representatives to make sure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. And there's so much that can be done um, from the power of your own seat, no matter what uniform or cape you wear. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, that stood out, you're right. I mean, it, it does have to become a new norm for us, um, at least for now, unfortunately. Uh, you know, you mentioning the ventilators, which is apparently this huge, I don't want to say apparently, it is, you know, a huge need uh, in the U.S., definitely in New York City, right? Uh, being here and hearing the mayor and the governor speak about the needs uh, of the ventilators and how long it takes to produce. Uh, if you if you do know, what is typically what's, I don't want to say what's standard, but uh, obviously the need for ventilators has risen dramatically, right? Absolutely. I, 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 want, I want you to kind of paint a picture for, for us where like what normal looks like typically for mm -hmm. a practitioner, um, even whether it's ventilators or how many patients they see to like what they're experiencing what they're experiencing now and why there's, there seems to be such a big need. And, under, and again, I get, and we get that, you know, more people are getting sick, but I don't think some people really understand like the stress that mm -hmm. um, 
uh, practitioners and people within the medical field, researchers, everyone is going through. So can you kind of paint that picture? Oh, man. I mean, you think about it, right? Like in a typical, like in a, in a, like a fast, like a, in an ICU, maybe, and don't quote me on this, but maybe like, you know, someone, maybe if you talk to a nurse, right? You talk to a nurse, you talk to a doctor, a nurse, maybe let's say a nurse, you talk to a nurse and, and he or she says that um, they have four patients today. And you might be like, oh, four patients, that's manageable. But for an ICU setting, those, that four patients may be hell because those patients are, depending on what they're suffering from, they're dealing with the worst and the worst of symptoms. And you're trying to stabilize them, keep them alive, you know, uh, make sure they're good, et cetera, deal with anything that comes up um, with that patient. And it all goes back down to saying that what I talked about earlier, when you have this disease, ultimately what it does is it saps your ability uh, in the worst cases for your body to provide oxygen, true oxygen to the other portions of, you know, your system. And, um, and, and that isn't the only bad thing, but that's one of the major things that I can speak to. And so when you think about that, what these ventilators then help you do, is these ventilators help you to maintain the proper oxygen content that you should be distributing in your body and help breathe for you and help take care of those things for you. And so maybe now these hospitals are starting to see three and four and five times the patient load that they would be seeing in a system like that. They just don't have those, that, that, that critical equipment necessary. And it's just not mass produced at a large enough rate for them to be able to expect this. The infrastructure has had to change, basically has had to accommodate a change basically overnight and it wasn't ready for it. And so ideally now, you know, you see some of these job postings for some of these um, medical personnel that are flying into these critical areas like New York City. And it's like, hey, expect to work, you know, 12 or 13 days straight with no break. And it's like they're dealing with now the four patients becomes five or six patients on an ICU floor um, and everybody's being overstretched. So I can't specifically speak to, you know, what the normal is, but conceptually you can understand that everybody's being stretched because now that life-saving equipment that is that has had to be that needs to be utilized is now being distributed amongst more people. And so that's why there's the need for people to jerry-rig um, out of necessity this life-saving equipment because usually it's one ventilator for one person because the ventilator reads kind of what you're giving it from your breath. And then it gives you what you need. So it's like, oh, you don't have enough? All right, cool. This is what you need for to be enough. And that's why it's one ventilator per one patient. And so now when these different innovations are coming to play, they, they're jerry-rating the ventilator so the ventilator can read maybe six or eight people at a time. So now the equipment shortage doesn't become that limiting factor or less of a limiting factor because it will always be a limiting factor. So it's people, it's the human, the manpower, the capital, uh, I mean, the human capital, and then it also is the, the equipment and the critical interventions. And we don't even have a treatment yet that's FDA approved that we can say is safe, is efficacious, and works, you know, to the standard that's necessary to save um, humans, human life. There are a lot of trials that are going on. There's some very um, promising things that are coming out of it, but nothing has been cleared yet. So it's, it's, that's, that's the picture that I want to paint. Uh, so tell me if this is true, because I, I, I don't know. I, I heard that they are graduating. They're allowing uh, doctors and <laughs> nurses to graduate early yeah. uh, to kind of, you know, help with this. Is, is there any truth behind that? Yeah, so there wow. is. Um, you know, they're allowing a lot of uh, medical school students and nurses to get right into the field. Um, you know, doctors usually, you know, medical doctors usually have after you, get, after you finish medical school, you usually have what's called your intern year. And then you, you know, it's the first year of your specialty. Um, and then you kind of go into your intern year and you're an internist and you deal with these type of cases. Um, and so it's, it's, it's difficult because you're jumping right into a situation where, you know, you're, you may not even have finished a little bit more of your rotations. You may not necessarily have, may not be necessarily be ready for it. And then on top of that, you know, and I hate to say that money makes a difference, but they're not getting paid for this type of stuff. You know, they're still getting that um, internist uh, salary, whereas maybe somebody else who's being thrown into 
the situation is getting three, four, or five times what they're making. So, and they're spending the same amount of hours. And so it's, 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 a, it's definitely a difficult situation. And that speaks to how stretched thin the community is when you have to consider that people who really haven't finished their training are kind of, um, you know, in that last year or rounding the last corner are now being pressed into service uh, because we are stretched thin. Wow, that's, uh, that's crazy. Well, uh, first off, uh, I, I definitely want to I, I thank you for your time, man. It was a lot of really, really good information. Uh, you know, one of the things I want to make sure I highlight was just, like you said, uh, the impacts of, of the community, especially uh, the low-income community, uh, just our norms now, right? You mentioned going, into, going outside and just wearing a mask, people not being in school, it affecting sports um, right now which is definitely huge for me. Uh, huge, huge. Uh, and, and a lot of people, not just, you know, people losing their jobs, uh, unemployment rate has skyrocketed, you know, it's mm -hmm. the highest it's ever been. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of impacts of uh, what this virus has, has done, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, definitely I wanna make sure, you know, continue to be safe, man. Do you have any, uh, before I let you go, is there anything you're working on or anything that I, that I missed that you may want to mention that's important? What's happening? I mean, I mean, this is, this, this was great. This is a great opportunity. And, and Mike, I think what you're doing is shooting things like this and bringing awareness to the people, um, getting individuals on here that can speak to this sort of thing, or just even inquiring about how people are handling different things. Um, just be on the, I, I would say just for your listeners, just, look and, and dig and search for the right information that's verified and back. Uh, CDC is always a good reference. Uh, there's for people who can't find masks or can't find, um, you know, or, or thinking about alternatives to making their own protection. Um, and so when it comes to face masks and gloves and such, uh, there's all sorts of resources that are out there. If you're a small business and you don't know about this stimulus package or whatever you want to call what they just did, an attempt at a stimulus package, um, you know, there's resources out there to be able to at least get yourself a little bit of funding so that you can, um, you know, plug the water a little bit. Um, and, 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 and some of it, depending on what you use it for, you may not have to repay back. So look at the, um, the sba.gov, um, go to cdc.gov, uh, make sure you're staying safe and don't be a fool. You know, don't think that it can't affect me because one of the things that you have to think about is it may not affect you, but it's going to affect somebody close to you. If you spread it to them, you don't know what anybody, anybody or that you encounter, what their immune system may be like or how this virus may affect them. So think beyond yourself. Think about other people and just stay safe. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to work on yourself. And that doesn't necessarily always mean learning a new skill. It also can just mean being healthy and just taking time for yourself and being at one in peace with yourself. So utilize this time, this too shall pass. We just gotta be smart and we are all in this together. Awesome, and I appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions, uh, how can they find you? Oh yes, um, they can definitely find me via my Instagram at Ruan Cox, at R-U-A-N-C-O-X. Or um, if they have any questions, uh, they can get at me there. They can get at me through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the same way. And then my email, rrcoxjr at gmail.com. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for your time, man. I, I, I appreciate it. Again, excellent, excellent information uh, for the community, uh, for the people. And again, I hope you guys got a ton from it. So as usual, man, I love you guys. Take care. All right. Thanks. Not a problem.